morning again, everyone, and welcome back to Allen Temple's parking lot virtual uh, ministry this morning. We hope everyone has had a blessed week. We hope everyone has been safe, and we're glad to see everyone in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. For those of you in the parking lot, let me remind you that you can tune in to 90.7 on FM and you will be able to hear the entire service in its entirety. That's 90.7 on your FM dial. Now this morning, our morning hymn this morning is, I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I will serve him till I die. Yes, I am on the battlefield for my Lord. Without any further lining, let us lift our mighty voices to an almighty God. So as we clear our minds and open our hearts and let us approach the throne of grace in prayer. Amen. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are all on this battlefield for you, Lord. 
Lord, it is a struggle down here, but we call on your name right now for you to alleviate the stresses and the pains that some of us are feeling right now. Father God, yes, it's a battlefield, but we claim the Christian battlefield right now because we know who goes before us right now. We know who is leading the charge right now to fight the ills and evils of this world. Father God, there is so much going on with all these deaths. Father, we just ask you to lift up all the families that were touched last night by all the killings in this city. We, Father God, we ask you to pray. We pray for those right now who have been injured and died last night. We even pray for the shooters, Father God, because God, we know something must be wrong with their mind when they don't have you in their lives to do such evil things. So we pray for the recovery. We pray for them to find you, Father. We pray for them to know an all-knowing and all-saving God that will help them with their minds. Because we know the battlefield is not physically out here in this physical world, but the battlefield is in our mind what the devil is trying to take. He's trying to confuse us, Lord. He is the author of confusion. But Father God, you're the author of truth. And we stand on your truth. We love you, Father. We magnify your Holy Son's name, Jesus Christ, who he died on the battlefield for us. He showed us how to prepare and how to be in the battle. But all we have to do is call on that matchless name of Jesus, and he'll fight our battles for us. So, Father God, we call you on your son, Jesus. We plead the blood over this service and over each and every person that hears this, this, this service right now. We plead the blood of Jesus on them. Wrap your arms around them. Wrap your arms around us. And we'll be so mindful to always give you the praise which you richly deserve. We ask these blessings. We say this prayer in your name, through your son, Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen. Amen.
church say amen. amen. If you're just happy to be alive today, put your hands together and give God some praise. Amen. 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 Let me hear your horns if you're happy to be alive today. Amen. 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 We serve a mighty good God. I said we serve a mighty good God. I said to you again, we serve a mighty good God. He tells us at the beginning of every week to take a portion of our goods and set them aside as a show of faith unto him. Those of us within the spiritual sense already know that everything we have belongs to God. When we pay our tithes and offering, we're not doing God a favor. We're just being faithful to a God that's been mighty good to all of us. But what a gracious God we serve. He says, if you be faithful and do what I have asked you to do, I'll open up the winds of heaven and pour you out a blessing too much for you to receive. Somebody has asked, are we still taking our conference claims? We certainly are. Amen. And we ask that you would pay your conference claim. I think it's $250 for the year. Uh, you can pay so much a month, so much a week. Uh, we take pennies, checks, credit, good credit cards, good checks, uh, however you want to pay it. We thank you for your faithfulness. Alan Temple, you have been a faithful church through this pandemic, and I thank God for each and every one of you. And we ask that those of you who are watching now who would like to give online, you can go to www.allentemple.org, and you can scroll down to Secure Give, and you can give there. For those of you who are here, there are people walking around, there are gentlemen walking around, and they will take your offering if you have it. And for those who want to bring it later in the week and continue to put it in the mailbox. We thank God for you, and we ask that you would continue to do that. God bless you. Amen, somebody. Will you please rise for you at the parking lot and for you at home, will you please rise for the reading of the scripture. This morning's scripture will be found in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. That's 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. And it reads, The Lord sent Nathan to David, and when he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared its food, he, it shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. The word of God for the people of God. All praises be to God. You all may be seated. Thank you. 
Let us pray. I am thine, O Lord. I've heard thy voice. It had told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Eternal God and Father, it's me again, standing in the need of prayer. Focus my mind, calm my spirit. Send the Holy Spirit, who is the real preacher, and use me today like you've never used me before. I'll be so careful, God, not to be puffed up in my ability. Because I'm certain today it's not my ability, but your anointing that breaks the yokes in the lives of your people. Have your way, and I'll give your name to praise. And the redeemed of the Lord agree by shouting, Amen. Amen. If you can't stand, we ask that you would stand, even if you're at home, in respect for the word of God. You heard 2 Samuel. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 7, for your hearing and understanding. I want you to go back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning at verse 5. 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning at verse 5. In the New International Version, these simple words are penned. After David heard this story, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. You may be seated in the presence of God and I want to preach for just a few minutes today from the subject, where is Nathan? Where is Nathan? Saints of God, Nathan was an Old Testament prophet who lived during the time of David. Nathan is introduced in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 2 and 1 Chronicles chapter 17 verse 1 as an advisor of David. Now saints, I need you to catch this. Many people misinterpret what a prophet or what prophecy was in the Old Testament times. But saints, listen, seldom and I did say seldom did prophecy involve the foretelling of the future. But Nathan was called in Hebrew a Nabi, which means that he was a prophet who spoke to the present time. Simply put, uh, Nathan's words were highly contextual messages from God to his people and especially to those people who were in power. Saints, the prophets railed against corruption and exploitation of the weak. And saints, prophets demanded that, 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 that the powerful use their power in order to take care of the poor and the oppressed. Prophets told those in power, it's your job to feed the sheep, not to fool around with the sheep. Prophets told the king and the people in power that if you don't care for the most vulnerable among you, you have no right to call yourself a, a man of God. Saints in antiquity, prophets were routinely ignored. They were routinely scorned and persecuted. Because saints, any time you tell people who are in power they are wrong, you will seldomly be rewarded. Ah, uh, saints, listen. Uh, Nathan uh, was not just any old prophet. Uh, he was a court prophet. Uh, and saints, court prophets were men who were on the king's payroll. Uh, 
So most court prophets uh, told the king whatever the king wanted to hear. Say so court prophets uh, had a habit of telling the people uh, that what the king said or did was blessed by God, uh, whether it was or not. Uh, oh yes, saints, uh, when the king spoke, most court prophets uh, who were nothing but religious puppets uh, who would assure the people uh, that even if the king or what the king was doing or saying seemed wrong, it was all right. Uh, all saints, uh, as far as court prophets were concerned, uh, the king was to be honored and obeyed. Uh, all saints, the court prophets uh, were the Paula Whites and the Ron Parsleys of yesteryear, uh, running behind Donald Trump, uh, upholding his mess, uh, because they were getting something personally out of the deal. Uh, all saints, even when the king uh, did wrong, uh, a good court prophet, like a good house negro, uh, would tell the people uh, that that the rules of morality uh, and the rule of decency uh, did not apply to the king. Oh yes, uh, saints, because their pockets were getting fat off of the king, uh, court prophets always urged the people by saying, God told me to tell you uh, that you should trust the king and obey him blindly. Our uh, saints, listen, uh, court prophets didn't care about justice. Uh, they started with the king uh, and they twisted justice uh, to fit the king's agenda. And saints, listen, uh, uh, the true prophets, uh, they started with justice uh, and were willing to confront the ruler no matter what it cost them. And saints, one of the clearest examples uh, we have today in the Bible of this uh, is when Nathan had the nerve and the audacity uh, to walk right up to the king, uh, the David, uh, the most popular and powerful king in Israel's history and say, you are the man who has committed this great sin against the weak. Now, saints, let me give you the story real quick, and I'll give you three quick points, uh, and we'll shout our way out of here. But David lusted after a married woman named Bathsheba, who was married to one of his trusted soldiers, uh, whose name was Uriah. One night, the Bible says, uh, David was on his rooftop, and he couldn't sleep. Uh, and so he went out to get some night air, and he saw Bathsheba taking a bath in the moonlight. David liked what he saw. Listen, somebody. And Saints David would later send for Bathsheba, whose husband was away fighting, and he slept with Bathsheba, and Bathsheba became pregnant. In order to cover up this incident, the Bible says that David had Uriah killed. David thought, Saints, in his mind, that this incident was hidden, but it was not hidden from all mighty God. And one day God sent Nathan to David with this message. Nathan said, uh, he said, he told a story uh, of two men, uh, a rich man and a poor man. Uh, the rich man had a large number of oxen and sheep, uh, while the poor man only had one little lamb that he loved dearly, uh, and he treated it like it was his own child. Uh, Says so one day, uh, Nathan said, uh, a traveler came, a visitor came to the rich man's house. But instead of the rich man slaughtering one of, the, uh, of his own sheep, the rich man took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the traveler to eat. Oh, saints, when Nathan told David this story, David was filled with anger. And David said, as surely as the Lord lives, a person who acts like this deserves to die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a wicked thing and had no pity. Saints, after David finished talking, uh, Nathan replied, uh, you are the man. Uh, you had everything. Uh, David, you already had 77 wives, uh, but you took another man's wife. Uh, oh, saints, uh, if we ever needed a Nathan, uh, we sure do need a Nathan in the world right now. Uh, and just in case uh, God is calling somebody here today uh, to be a Nathan, uh, let me give you three quick uh, characteristics of a Nathan, uh, and we'll shout our way out of here. But first of all, uh, all prophets like Nathan uh, are courageous in their confrontation of leadership. Uh, saints, uh, it has, it had to be uh, frightening uh, from a human perspective uh, from, for Nathan uh, to confront David. Saints, the historical account uh, doesn't give us detail uh, about how Nathan uh, was directed to confront David, uh, but the Bible 
Bible simply says uh, in chapter 12, verse 1, uh, that the Lord sent Nathan to David. Yeah. Now, let's be clear. Uh, Nathan wasn't confronting just any old man about his sin. Uh, he was confronting the king of Israel, who was well beloved, uh, and a man who had a bad temper. Uh, all saints, Nathan uh, was between a rock and a hard place. Uh, he had to confront David about his sin uh, or say no to God. Uh, so Nathan said to himself, uh, I'd rather be David be mad at me uh, than God be mad at me. Uh, Saints, I can hear Nathan saying, uh, if David gets mad at me, uh, I got a chance to hide from David. Uh, but where in the world uh, can I hide from God? Uh, I hear Nathan saying, uh, I might be able to outrun David, uh, but I sure cannot outrun God. Saints, listen, uh, throughout David's reign as king, uh, he had a reputation for killing folk uh, who made him mad. Uh, saints today, uh, in the 21st century, uh, you and I have a saying uh, that many of us use frequently, uh, and it says, don't kill the messenger. Ah, uh, uh, but saints, uh, many of you know this saying, but what you don't know is this, uh, that that saying came from the life uh, and the practice of King David. Uh, see, saints, uh, like a few other famous leaders, uh, David was a short man, uh, and saints, uh, um, David suffered uh, from what we call Napoleon complex, uh, also known as little man syndrome. Uh, and saints, listen, uh, anthropologists have discovered uh, that the average height during David's time uh, was 4 foot 11. Uh, uh, stand up, little Terry. Uh, uh, that means uh, little Terry was the average height of a man uh, during David's time. Uh, tell your, your neighbor and say, now that's mighty small right there. Uh, oh, saints, listen, uh, David was considered short uh, based on little Terry's standards. Uh, and saints, listen, uh, Short men in leadership uh, tend to overcompensate uh, for their lack of height uh, by trying to be super tough, uh, domineering, uh, and, uh, and real aggressive in their behavior. Saints, listen, uh, David had little man syndrome, uh, and he didn't like to receive bad news. And history tells us uh, that whenever a messenger brought David some news he didn't like uh, or some news he didn't want to hear, David would immediately have him killed. Uh, so that's why today, uh, when you and I have to give someone bad news uh, or tell somebody something uh, that they don't want to hear uh, and they get angry with us, uh, we tell them quick, fast, and in a hurry, uh, look, uh, I'm just bringing the news. Uh, don't kill the messenger. Uh, now, saints, David uh, and Nathan uh, had a history together. Uh, and Nathan knew that David had little man syndrome. Uh, and he knew David had a quick temper. Uh, Nathan had worked close with David for many years. So Nathan knew uh, David had a reputation. Uh, he saw it firsthand uh, of David killing people who brought him news he didn't want to hear. And saints, before Nathan confronts King David, uh, Nathan already understood uh, that David uh, could have him beheaded uh, for daring to step to him about his sin. Ah, uh, uh, but saints, because uh, he was anointed by God, uh, Nathan walked right up to King David and told him a clever story. Uh, and then he looked him in the face and said, Thou art the man. Because, saints, when the leader's life did not line up with the word, Nathan was courageous in his confrontation of leadership. But not only was Nathan a confrontational and brave and courageous in his confrontation of leadership, but Nathan was skillful enough to have to use godly wisdom in his confrontation. I'm almost done, but listen. Saints, look at Nathan's well-crafted approach. First, Nathan used David's experience as a shepherd. I don't want you to miss this here. The choice of a lamb in this story was both powerful and purposeful. Oh, saints, listen. Nathan appealed to the heart of David, the shepherd boy who is now the king. Nathan knew if anybody stood, understood the love of a special lamb, it would be David, the former shepherd. 
And then saints, after appealing to David's life as a shepherd, Nathan appealed to David's knowledge of the law. Saints, the unnamed man in Nathan's story violated several Mosaic laws. But let me give you a couple of them right here. First, the man in the story that Nathan was telling violated the Tenth Commandment that says, Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house, nor his wife, nor his servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. The second thing that happens is that when David pronounces the judgment of restoring the lamb fourfold, that was a direct application of Exodus 22 and 1 that says, If a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it or sells it, he must repay the oxen five times over and the sheep four times over. Ah, oh, says Nathan knew that David understood the law. He understood that David understood shepherding and sheep. And saints, think about how wise and how crafty Nathan is here. Nathan knew David would get angry. Nathan knew David would blow his top. Nathan knew that David would see the speck in another man's eye and miss the telephone pole that was in his own eye. And saints, right when David lost it, Nathan said, Thou art the man. And saints, look at how he presents this thing. Nathan was wise enough to allow David to pronounce his own judgment upon himself. And saints, listen, Nathan was wise. Ah, but listen, Nathan took a risk. Nathan didn't try to defend David's sin. Nathan didn't try to justify David's wrong. No, instead of cowering before the king, Nathan rose to the challenge and confronted David with thus saith the Lord. And saints, listen, when you have to confront sin, you won't be popular. Am I preaching to anybody today? When you have to confront sin, you will be taking a risk. When you speak up on your job or speak up to your boss, you will suffer some consequences. So you got to be wise. But know this, wise confrontation just might turn somebody back to God. And that's what James wrote in his epistle. He says, my brothers and my sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and somebody brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save that person's soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Oh, saints, listen. Whether David liked it or not, it was Nathan that saved his soul from death. And saints, hear me and hear me well. Sometimes when you rebuke folk, you're going to lose some friends. I wish y'all would help me. Sometimes when you rebuke folk, it's going to cost you a job. Sometimes when you got some rough stuff to say to somebody, it's going to cost you some sleepless nights. Sometimes it may even cost you your very life. But the question is this. Are you willing to risk it all to tell somebody there's danger ahead. Are you willing to tell somebody, proceed with caution? Are you willing to just boldly tell somebody, God doesn't bless what he forbids? Are you willing to tell somebody that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life? Ah, oh, well, your, your excitement today is overwhelming, uh, but it's time for me to go. But the question is, uh, where is Nathan? Do me a favor, wake your neighbor up. Some of them sleep, I'm looking at them, uh, and ask your neighbor, say, neighbor, uh, where is Nathan? Uh, uh, but I want you to know today, if you're going to be a Nathan, uh, the first thing you got to do uh, is you got to be courageous in your confrontation of leadership. Uh, or turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, uh, you got to be courageous. Uh, but not only do you have to be courageous in your confrontation of leadership, uh, you must learn uh, how to use wisely judgment uh, in your confrontation. Uh, or turn to another neighbor and say, neighbor, not only do you have to be courageous, you have to be wise. But lastly, Nathan was a true prophet who spoke truth to power. Saints, because he was a true prophet, Saints Nathan walked right up to David. He put his finger in David's face and convicted him of sin by declaring, thou art the man. Saints, Nathan spoke truth to power. And Nathan said to David, king, you are wrong. And David repented. And Saints, did you hear what I said? Instead of 
Nathan losing his head, he won a repentant king. And saints, listen, when you are called of God, the powers that be, and the powers that be, welcome you into their princes of power. You can't go on there skinning and grinning. You can't go on there bending and bowing. You can't be happy because you're the first Negro to make it into those precincts. You got to speak truth to power. You ain't helping because I'm talking about you, but I feel like preaching. Saints, ain't it sad today that Dr. Anthony Fauci and Miss Nancy Pelosi have more courage than these so-called evangelical preachers of God? Oh, I know I'm right about it. Saints, America is in trouble today because we have ungodly leadership. That's right, I said it. And we have evangelical preachers who care more about their bank accounts and their party affiliations than they care about the calling that's on their life. We need a Nathan today who's willing to condemn unrighteousness in the rulers, even if it costs them everything. Y'all still ain't helping me. We need a Nathan today. Somebody who's willing to be fired. We need a Nathan today. Somebody who's willing to be maligned. We need a Nathan today. Somebody who's willing to be misrepresented. Somebody who's willing to stand flat-footed and look the leader in the face and declare black lives matter. We need a Nathan today who's willing to speak up as this president aims ugly and demeaning statements towards women and people of color. Oh, you Republicans, y'all can still help me make America great again. It ain't gonna happen until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. And let me say this before I take my seat. And to my white and to my white look and to my white co laborers of the gospel, uh, let's be clear. Don't call me your friend anymore if you're going to continue to remain silent uh, through this wicked time. Uh, my white Christian brothers and sisters, uh, black folks and other minorities, uh, we don't need you to whisper to us in private uh, that racism is wrong. Uh, but we need you to tell your friends. Uh, we need you to tell your prejudiced family members. Uh, we need you to tell your neighbors uh, and fellow worshipers uh, that racism is wrong. Uh, to my white friends, uh, don't be captive uh, uh, to a political party uh, because as a Christian uh, and a child of God, uh, you are accountable to a higher authority. Uh, uh, saints, I'm almost through. Uh, but saints, listen, uh, the court prophets in the Old Testament uh, were kept by the kings uh, as a way uh, of attempting to defend themselves uh, against real prophets uh, through whom God spoke uh, a word of warning, judgment, and condemnation uh, for the leaders and the people being unfaithful. Uh, saints, listen, uh, uh, the court prophets pretended uh, to have a prophetic word, uh, which they just made up uh, on the basis of what they thought the king wanted to hear. Uh, but saints, court prophets uh, had a job to do, uh, and they did it well. Uh, but I want you modern-day court prophets to hear me and hear me well. Uh, you better, you better, you think being a court job, uh, a court prophet is a good job. Uh, but I hear Jeremiah saying, uh, and Jeremiah 14, 1 through 6, uh, he describes a drought uh, that has gripped the land. Uh, and he said, the word of the Lord came to me in the midst of the drought. Uh, and when Jeremiah attempted to pray for the people, uh, the Lord said, uh, do not pray uh, for the well-being of these people. Uh, saints, listen, uh, this is one of the most terrifying verses in the Bible. Uh, because God says to Jeremiah, don't even pray for the people uh, because it's too late. Uh, saints, the land and uh, he says uh, the land will face judgment uh, because your court prophets uh, have falsely prophesied. Well, saints, let me go on and close this thing. Uh, but saints know this. Uh, there's a difference uh, between a true prophet uh, and a court prophet. Uh, saints, listen, uh, a true prophet, uh, the words are rooted in the word of God. Uh, uh, but, but a court prophet's words uh, are made up to keep the, the people in power happy. Uh, a court prophet uh, speaks truth to power uh, but a false prophet says uh, whatever they think the leader wants to hear. Uh, a true prophet uh, is bold and courageous uh, but a court prophet uh, is nothing but a coward. Uh, saints listen, uh, in this season uh, of COVID-19 uh, it's not a time for politics. Uh, and court prophets I want you to listen. Uh, Christians I want you to hear me. Uh, politics will get 
you into trouble. Uh, yeah, I said it. Uh, and says, listen, uh, judgment is already in the land. Uh, and either the people of God uh, are going to do what's right uh, or we're going to perish with these modern day false uh, prophets. Uh, and says, I'm on my way to my seat. Uh, but remember, uh, it was politics uh, that sent Jesus to the cross. Uh, yes, uh, the governor Pontius Pilate uh, knew Jesus was innocent. Uh, but he gave any power to the masses uh, because of political pressure. Uh, uh, and they said, give us Barabbas. Uh, but saints, listen, uh, this world uh, needs a Nathan. Uh, this country uh, needs a Nathan. Uh, this president uh, needs a Nathan. Uh, this White House uh, and the whole needs a Nathan. Uh, but where is Nathan? Uh, but before I sit down, uh, let me remove this question from the White House uh, and bring it back to your and my house. Where is Nathan? Yes, Who is the person in the family who's willing to confront sin that's in your house? And say, if you know that this country and this world needs a Nathan right now, if you know right now you need a Nathan in your house, yes, come on, help me close this thing. Ain't it good? Yes. Ain't it great? Yes. Ain't it all right? Yes.